Look, let's start the program with our exclusive interview this week with the former New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian. She resigned as Premier following the revelation that she had given evidence to the Independent Commission Against Corruption into the behaviour of her former colleague and partner, Daryl Maguire. The final report of that investigation is yet to be handed down. Berejiklian joined the telecommunications company Optus as its Managing Director of Enterprise, Business and Institutional. And this week I sat down with the former New South Wales Premier and her boss, the Chief Executive of Optus, Kelly Bayer-Rosemarin, for an exclusive first broadcast interview. Kelly Bayer-Rosemarin, Gladys Berejiklian, many thanks for your time. Kelly, can I start with you? Why was it that you hired Gladys Berejiklian? so quickly after she'd come out of politics, and given the fact also that there was still an ICAC report to be handed down into her, her behaviour, were you concerned at all about any behavioural consequences or reputational risk to Optus as a result of that? So for us, it was a really wonderful opportunity to hire somebody who has a lot of integrity, great work ethic, who gained the respect of everybody in New South Wales and managed through the pandemic in an exemplary way and has a long track record of delivering great results for stakeholders. Um, we've brought in Gladys to look after our business and enterprise teams. It's a part of the market where despite many years of trying, the incumbent still holds a very significant market share and so we need to shake it up and think differently, bring in someone smart with a fresh perspective who's willing to think differently, work hard and build a great team around her uh, that's going to transform that part of the business for us. So we were really delighted to welcome Gladys on board. We of course considered all the issues and decided the public is smart enough to be able to know what Gladys does at Optus and separate that from her time before in politics. I was going to ask you about that, Gladys. I mean, coming into a job such as this, it's still a profile. You've had a very low profile since you took this job. Were you at all concerned about going into a business, again, with that ICAC report, still to be delivered at some point in the future? Look, I relished the opportunity to roll up my sleeves and work hard for an organisation I believe in. Uh, for an organisation who have amazing people, an amazing leader, and some, an organisation that touches millions of Australians. And I found that extremely appealing. And I think people appreciate that once you leave public life, uh, my decision was to go back to the private sector and to work hard, and that's what I'm looking forward to doing. And looking forward to really contributing uh, to economic growth and supporting businesses on their journey, especially as the headwinds approach. Yeah, OK, so can I ask you about when the two of you were negotiating, what sort of commitment, when you looked at each other in the eye and shook hands on the deal, what sort of a commitment for tenure did you give to Kelly? Well, I gave her a commitment to work my hardest and do my best. And I was also very fussy about who I worked for. I think Kelly is one of the best business leaders we have in Australia. Uh, she's incredibly intelligent, knows how to bring people together with purpose and inspire, in our case, about 6,000 people. But you'd understand what I mean about that is 10 years important because there is a lot of speculation about you returning to politics at oh, some stage have, down the track. I've already said I have no interest in that whatsoever. Mike. And, and look, it's not usual that when you take on a business leader and are building the dream team that you ask each person to give you a particular commitment of length of time. Um, so I wouldn't have imposed anything like that on Gladys when I don't impose that on other leaders that I bring in. My job is to build the strongest possible team for Optus and for our customers and to inspire them to want to be here every day, giving 100% and living to their best potential by being here. So it's up to me to create the environment that retains the best people and makes this the right place for the best people to do their best work every day. Do you think Gladys would make a good member of our federal parliament in the future? Do you think that uh, ultimately she might make a good prime minister of this country? <laughs> what I might want for Gladys may not be the same as what she wants for herself. Yeah. Do you think you've ultimately been burnt from politics and that really this life is now an easier life for you from a personal profile? I mean, as I say, you've been very quiet. You've deliberately kept away uh, from media since that time 
as compared with the past when you were front page of the papers most days? Look, I exceeded my expectations as to what I would achieve in public life and that's behind me and I'm proud of what I've done uh, but I'm now looking forward to the future and I am so feel so grateful that Optus has welcomed me the way they have and the contribution we're making again to economic growth, supporting businesses, especially in the segment that I've got the privilege of looking after, small, medium and large businesses who are the backbone of our economy and uh, looking forward to continuing to get my teeth stuck into this really important job. OK, so Kelly, can I go to something that Gladys has had input to? And that was the fight that you have got right now to try and prevent Telstra from basically merging its services with TPGs in regional areas of Australia. Um, in many ways, that I would have thought prevents the doubling or tripling up of infrastructure being built in those, in those areas. Why is that such an important fight for you right now? Yeah, I mean, this is really important for Australia because, as we know, the communication services that we provide are highly valued by all Australians and people have come to rely on them every day to be able to complete their work, talk to their loved ones, be entertained. Every facet of our lives actually relies on having good, reliable connectivity. What regional Australia needs is more connectivity, not less. And unfortunately, this proposal is about reducing the amount of infrastructure that there is in regional Australia. It's about the number one player and the number three player banding together and ganging up on the number two player. And we don't think that that's healthy for competition, for innovation, and it will overturn 30 years of policy that's been designed to promote competition and access, particularly in regional areas and it will result in higher prices and worse outcomes for Australians in the bush. Just one question about that. Was TPG ever really going to roll out much infrastructure in the future? Wasn't it really always going to be you and, uh, and Telstra that was going to roll out the infrastructure? Yeah, so there's a lot, of, a lot of elements to answering that question. So firstly, TPG does have some infrastructure in regional areas, and part of the proposed arrangement is for TPG to give that infrastructure to Telstra and actually to decommission a bunch of it. So that does mean there's a diminishing of infrastructure in regional Australia. Uh, over and above that, TPG is also proposing to give all of its spectrum assets in the regions to Telstra, which circumvents all of the caps on spectrum ownership. And it means that Telstra will have a service that's really unassailable in the regions. Once that occurs, it becomes almost impossible to make a business case for any further investment in regional Australia. So is that the risk that ultimately your shareholders, Singapore Telecom in particular, would actually prevent more infrastructure being built in those regional areas because there is no business case to do Correct. so? Correct. Well, if you can't make a business case to somehow gain market share from investing in more infrastructure, then you can't justify doing that investment in more regional infrastructure. And as a result, you're going to have uh, a regional monopoly in the end. And we don't think that benefits anybody. OK, Gladys, the one role that you've been brought in here to do is to look after business and enterprise. But it strikes me that during the pandemic, of course, businesses now learnt to have their staff working from home, working remotely. This is a key part of the way in which the workforce has changed during the pandemic. Does it sort of ever enter your mind that as Premier and Transport Minister for New South Wales, you built infrastructure to get people into the metropolitan hubs. Now you're with Optus, you're sort of encouraging and helping them to stay at home. Well, I think the important thing to note is a lot of people chose to work from the regions and that's why the Telstra TPG proposal is of such a concern because it doesn't matter now where you work from, where you conduct your business. Uh, you actually need that vital connectivity and you need to have choice as to who you choose to be your provider or your carrier. So that's why I think what you've just put to me is a good case for why the Telstra TPG proposal should be knocked on its head because we want to encourage growth in our regional communities. We want to encourage people to do business, whether in a traditional workplace or from home and in our case I'm proud of the fact that we have a policy where we encourage staff to come in three days a week and then work two days flexibly. Other companies have different arrangements but no matter who you are you should have the choice as to where you work from if that's what your policy is, your company policy is and we should be able to provide that as a competitor, as a challenger in a very important part of the market. But you get my point is that really the recycling of assets that the New South Wales government did went largely into building brand new transport infrastructure that it really is the, the shining light in, in, of, of, re, of metropolitan cities in Australia. 
So the question is whether really in hindsight, without knowing the pandemic was coming along, whether that has been overdone, given the fact that people can now use Optus as services, Telstra services, the NBN and work from home. Well, I think the important thing is to provide options for people in a growing population. Our population won't be static. Uh, people will choose where they live and we need to give them those options. Uh, and why should someone, because of social disadvantage or another reason, be excluded from where they choose to work or live or play uh, because of access? And, and that's why, uh, whether it's in that hard infrastructure you speak about or telecommunications, it's vital to give those people good access accessible, uh, affordable options and that's why I feel so passionately about Optus continuing as, along with a lot, whole lot of other players in the market having that competitive opportunity to do so especially given there's far more decentralisation in how people are working, they're far more mobile, they're working from multiple sites, companies are, and businesses are really uh, very innovative in the way that they're supporting their employees and we want to be part of that indefinitely into the future in, in all parts of Australia. Okay yeah because Kelly this is a really important aspect of this. The democratisation of information means a person's location does not discriminate against them in terms of gaining information or being able to gain access to a market in another part of the world. That's really what high-speed broadband has brought to regional Australia. Um, and again, that's what companies such as Optus have brought to them as well. So are you conscious of this and making certain that that is affordable for those communities and for those people to be able to do that? Absolutely. And... Um you know, as, as Gladys has mentioned, we are passionate and cognizant of our role in underpinning the whole digital revolution. There is no future digital economy without the connectivity that underpins all of that. And we know that we've provided great options so far, but that it's not enough, particularly in regional areas. And that's why there's an enormous investment going into 5G, which unlocks economic growth for the country and competitive 5G will do so even more because not all 5G is equal. You can roll out 5G in a way that looks very similar and performs in a very similar way to 4G. Or you can roll out 5G that's super fast, low latency, a lot more throughput. And what we want to see is more investment in the right kind of future-oriented communications technology in Australia so that it unlocks our ability to be a true digital economy and compete on a global scale. And it does that across Australia, no matter where you live, and doesn't create a divide between the city and the country. So on that basis, though, with 5G and eventually 6G when that rolls out, do you make your money from selling the network or do you make your money from the enterprises that are hung off it? Telstra, as you know, has got an enterprise division. You've got one as well, where you're looking to make strategic investments. So where is the real money in this into the future for businesses such as yours? Well, for, for us at Optus at the moment, the majority of the money that we make comes from our consumer business. And that is because we have not been able to penetrate deeply enough into the business and enterprise sectors. Which is what we're Telstra to do. Exactly, where Telstra has about 70% market yep. share after 30 years of competing with them. So that's exactly what Gladys is here no to pressure. do. To no pressure. To unlock right. that, it's a huge growth opportunity for us. We know we have excellent technology. We know we have the fastest 5G in Australia. We know we have amazing people who are delivering a great service. We know we're more innovative than any telecommunications company in Australia and most around the world. And we want to bring those benefits to businesses and enterprises and government clients. And Gladys and I are going to work very hard to make sure we've got a strategy that brings that to fruition. OK, so you've now got to deal with the businesses. You used to deal with them when you were the Premier, when you were the Transport Minister, during your ministerial life. So the question is whether, A, you've got a, an, a receptive audience, and, and B, whether there is, again, enterprise that comes from this, joint ventures, collaborations, or whether you see this as being simply a selling of the network services. Well, I think what's really important for us is to put the business, the client, at the heart of everything we do. And as you know, Ross, the B2B market is very, very, is very um, different and diverse. And we have to make sure we cater for the right business and really make them feel that we're catering for their needs moving forward, whether it's a small business that's just starting off or a larger enterprise. Uh, we also have to be a step ahead. Sometimes businesses and, and larger 
companies aren't aware of what's available to them. Especially as people are now looking at their discretionary spend, they'll want to see, well, how can we do things more, simple, more simply? How can we digitise? How can we be more connected? Uh, and there are opportunities for us to really support them in that way. So I'm really looking forward to that. There's no doubt it's a very challenging part of the market for us, but also one in which I think we can really listen and learn from the market itself and respond accordingly depending on the external environment as well. But as Chief Executive, you be conscious, Kelly, of the fact that you, there are businesses who are customers of yours that make hundreds of millions or billions of dollars by using your network. The question is why you as the tel telco don't share in that money. That's my point. So where is the payback? If you're simply selling a service, of course, it's always going to be a race to the bottom in terms yeah, of competition. I mean, look, Ross, it's a great question. I often sit there and think, if, if you removed yourself from the realities of our industry, you would sit there and say, telecommunications services, everybody needs it every day, uses it every day, they're using more and more of it every day, they can't live without it. Telco should be in its heyday. We should be raking in the profits. And that is not true of the sector globally. The sector globally has falling ROICs and uh, yeah, real what are you challenges. Return, what's your return on assets at the moment? Um, it, it's lower than we would like it to be. And that's, again, true for the whole industry globally. And a lot of that is because we are investing most of that in continuously upgrading the infrastructure and making it better. And you're right, there are a lot of companies who profit over the top of that. Uh, without sharing those profits or reinvesting them back in the infrastructure in, that they're using to generate those profits. Including some of the biggest profits. global companies. Yeah, in, including big global companies. Google, Meta, go for your life. Yeah, Any of them. Netflix, the big gaming companies. That's right. In fact, some of them even will charge you more for high definition streaming, even though they don't pay for any of the streaming okay, infrastructure. So, we so, do. so in other words, so, it's the whole structure of the telecommunications correct. industry. Correct. So there right. are structural challenges with the telecommunications industry that do need to be addressed over time if we're going to sustainably be able to continue to invest in the level of infrastructure to meet the growing demand for our services and the voracious appetite for more and more data streamed more and more quickly. Okay, because so I have no doubt that problem. will evolve and who the conversation the, will mature. Who should pay for the infrastructure? At the moment, it's your company that pays for it or you seek some assistance from somewhere else. But, but who should pay for this long term? That's the big question. And that's what the industry should be working together to determine with all the stakeholders, uh, the OTTs, the streamers, the gamers, the telco companies, the equipment suppliers and the government. We should all be working together to determine the right level of continued investment that we want and a sustainable way to move forward so that all parties can benefit. OK, then does that mean the NBN comes into this as well, quite clearly? NBN Co this week puts out um, significantly improving profits, uh, debts being reduced dramatically. Um, and also that the government has rejected the approval of the ACCC for new wholesale pricing, which you are, are a beneficiary of. So some people would suggest that that means that any potential privatisation of NBN Co is now onto the back burner with this government at least anyway. Yeah, well, um, the privatisation of NBN has never been approved by any government. So as far as we're concerned, it hasn't been on the card. Yeah, I know, but it's been set up for it, it surely. It, it's certainly it, been you speculated You keep on pushing about. up wholesale prices to the highest <laughs> in the world. Something's going on, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I mean, look, what you can see is there's been a clear transfer of value between the telco operators to NBN. And uh, you can look at their level of profitability relative to the rest of us. I think for me, the most important thing that we can work with NBN to achieve is better service levels for customers. I, I believe one of the reasons that everybody struggles to make money reselling NBN is because we don't have the right level of customer focus and customer obsession coming from the NBN. So that means customer appointments aren't always met and the responsibility of taking those calls from customers, rescheduling things, falls on us. Um, there's faults with NBN or outages. Who gets the phone call? We do as the RSPs. So there's a lot of cost and time and effort layered into the whole system as a result of NBN 
not being so focused on customer outcomes you're and improving customer performance. You're saying it doesn't do its job, is that what you're telling me? You're telling me they don't do their I'm job. I'm saying their job should be redefined to be all about customer service. And if we could achieve that, there would be more profit to go around in this part of the market. Okay, so Gladys Berejiklian, you as Premier and previously, were the champion of privatisation. Sell assets, recycle those assets, go and create new infrastructure, get a charge on that, maybe sell it off, recycle it again. So here is a classic case where a government could recycle an asset, get the money, use it for something else that's more productive for the community. Should the NBN be privatised? Well, fortunately, I don't have to make that decision, but I will say this. Um, what pretty much shocked me when I entered the industry was that the NBN doesn't actually even have, to Kelly's point, a service level agreement. They're actually not accountable or have timeframes by which they have to provide customers with a particular service time. So that for me was quite shocking that if you're providing an essential service uh, and uh, so many people are relying on that service and corporations are relying on, on their business models depending on what you provide and not to have a service level agreement with either your business partners or else the public to me was quite confronting. So perhaps that could be your question to the CEO. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe that's where it goes to. Um, look, just to finish up, I can't not ask you this question. Um, one of your former colleagues, John Barillaro, has obviously been in front of an inquiry. Now, regardless of everything that's been said and, you know, what might come out of that, one question is about people who have been former politicians going into positions such as that. You have chosen not to do that. Just tell me about your own attitudes about the path that former politicians should take when they're leaving politics? Well, Ross, you're free to ask me that question. I don't have to answer it anymore. No, you don't have I, to answer it but anymore. But I will say I this, Ross. I will say this, Ross. Uh, I've taken a decision which I'm incredibly proud of and very excited by. I can't speak for what other people decide. I can only speak for myself. And I'm really, really looking forward to the next chapter of my life. And that's with Optus, with our amazing people, and really making a difference to the organisation, which is what I've always been about. And you're sure you can't be tempted back into politics at some stage? A million percent. <laughs> a million percent. I understand, Ross. We all miss seeing Gladys on the TV. <laughs> and taking bets on what colour jacket she's going to wear each day. So, uh, but I think she's doing a great public service by being at Optus, being at a challenger brand and helping us bring the magic of digitalisation to millions of businesses across Australia. So her impact will still be felt. Kelly Bayer-Rosemary and Gladys Berejiklian, many thanks for your Thank time. Thank you, Ross. Appreciate it. Thank you.